welcome, 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 welcome to Better Than Ever Live, wherever you're watching or wherever you're listening. Hope you're making today your masterpiece. In today's show, we're going to talk about running. Running is a form of arthritis and whether, or as a form of exercise and whether running worsens arthritis that's already present in your knee. We talk over and over and over that we all need to exercise, especially as you get older. I talk about it all the time. But is it appropriate for somebody that already has knee arthritis or should you switch to low impact exercise as so many orthopedic surgeons recommend. My name is Dr. David Geyer, double board certified orthopedic surgeon, sports medicine specialist, and media medical expert. I help you feel and perform your best regardless of age, injury, or medical history. And as always, please understand, I am not giving you medical advice. This is meant for general information and educational purposes only. If you have comments, hello, Robert, good to see you. If you have comments about running, you have comments about arthritis and some of the studies we're gonna talk about before we talk about running and arthritis, please leave those in the chat, not in the comments on YouTube. I am not using YouTube, I'm using Restream to send it to YouTube so all I can see is the chat. LinkedIn, Facebook, leave your comments as well and I will discuss them as we go, or if it's about running an arthritis, I'll discuss it at the end. I would love to know your first name and where you're located, along with your comment and question. And I just read a study, I'm gonna, I had already prepared some, uh, but I have one other that I may mention, maybe after the arthritis talk if we have time. But the first one I wanna talk about is about a food that I've talked about on this show before that I wanna start eating, and sadly I really haven't, but it may be one that I add back to it. It's this study that shows that eating avocado may help reduce your risk of heart attacks, especially if you eat avocado instead of things like butter, cheese, bacon, things like that. So these researchers studied about 70,000 women, about 40,000 men, and followed them every four years for three decades. Now, none of them when they started, they were all healthy, no history of heart disease, no history of stroke. But by the end of the 30 years, 11% of the women, 16% of the men had died or had just had experienced either a heart attack or stroke, and a lot of them died of that. What they found, it's like most nutrition studies, you have the endpoint and you work backwards to see what they ate all, you know, what their diet consisted of, and they found that people who ate at least two servings of avocado a week, that's basically at one whole avocado a week, 21% less likely to have a heart attack than people who never consumed avocado or people who only rarely did it. This was a study in the Journal of the American Medical Association. Now, avocado did not appear to influence the risk of stroke. Now, what seemed to be, they they speculated on this, this is, was a little harder to prove in the study, but that the avocado may have had the most benefit for people as part of a Mediterranean diet. And we've talked about this before a diet high in fruits and vegetables, whole grains, legumes, nuts, seeds, lots of olive oil as a healthy source of fat, moderate amounts of protein, dairy, eggs, fish, poultry, trying to limit red meat, trying to limit processed meat. Actually, I have another study about processed meat. Maybe I'll talk about that one next week, uh, about how uh, processed meat is devastating for your physical and mental uh, energy. Bacon, sausage, canned meat, beef jerky, the packaged meats like lunch meats, those kinds of things just are killers for your energy levels and fatigue. Anyway, uh, Mediterranean diet, pretty much no processed meat, very low red meat. But you add avocado to that, preferably replacing margarine, butter, yogurt, cheese, processed meats. That could reduce your risk of cardiovascular events like heart attacks 16 to 22 percent. It's fascinating. I have said that I want to start doing more avocado. I just need to do it. Uh, A lot of my friends love avocado too. So another one I want to talk about before we get into some more exercise topics is high blood pressure. So when we're talking about two of the biggest risk factors for cardiovascular disease, certainly not the only ones. There's hundreds of risk factors, but high blood pressure and high cholesterol. Well, we, what do we talk about to balance that exercise? healthy diet, like the Mediterranean diet. But a new study that just came out in the journal Nutrients shows that one particular ingredient, taken as a supplement preferably, could significantly lower your blood pressure. According to the researchers, what they found is aged garlic extract, aged black garlic extract, significantly reduced blood pressure in people with high cholesterol. And again, it's in a supplement form. 
Six weeks was all it took taking aged garlic for six weeks, significant reduction in diastolic blood pressure compared to people, especially in men, compared to people who had a placebo. So you add aged garlic to something like the Mediterranean diet or the DASH diet uh, that's recommended for high blood pressure could be an extremely effective uh, sort of strategy to prevent high blood pressure to, to help blood, uh, high blood pressure regress and protect your cardiovascular system. So that may be something else uh, that you think about as far as, all right, if I'm gonna take a supplement, maybe I add an aged garlic extract supplement. All right, we've talked a lot, and I talk about this quite a bit on my, uh, my media interview, my TV interviews for ABC and Fox here. I'm on those, both those networks you know, basically every day talking about a different health topic, sometimes COVID, but usually not COVID anymore. Uh, but I talk a lot about mental health and I talk a lot about exercise. And I've talked about the benefits of exercise for mental health. And there's all kinds of studies that have shown that exercise is good for your overall well-being. The question though is, on any given day, one session of exercise, how much does that help your depression. So what these researchers did, they took 30 adults diagnosed with depression and half of them were put in a session where they did 30 minutes of moderate intensity cycling or they just sat for 30 minutes and then a week later, second session, they did the opposite. And all along the way, before the exercise or sitting, midway through, after, 25 minutes after, 50 minutes after, 75 minutes after, they filled out these surveys measuring depression symptoms, cognitive abilities, mood, things like that. What they found in the group that did 30 minutes of exercise, mood was significantly higher, not just during the exercise and immediately after, but up to 75 minutes after. Now they also had improvements in cognitive function, but that was a little bit more short-lived. Little fat, fun fact for if you have students as kids, or maybe you're a student yourself, if you wanna learn something really well, go exercise right before you go to study. The, it delivers blood flow to your brain, it, it delivers a lot of um, neurotrophic factors that help memory, help learning. So eh, unrelated to this, but is good. But the cognitive improvements they saw uh, were fairly short lived. But then, so they did a second part of this study where they took 10 of them and they basically did exercise wanting to see its effects on therapy for depression. So half of them did 30 minutes of moderate intensity exercise, cycling, jogging, right before an hour long therapy session. The other group just went about their daily lives, then did the therapy session. And what they found out, and they did that for, for eight weeks, what they found out is both groups did better. The therapy definitely helped these depressed patients, but the group that exercised had much better reductions in uh, their depression symptoms. They made quicker and stronger connections with their therapist. They, were, they, got, they said they got more out of the therapy sessions and were more likely to attend. So if that isn't pretty good evidence that exercise can significantly improve your mental health and help with depression, I don't know what is. All right, and the last exercise thing I talk about before I get into running, we've all had periods where we don't sleep well. And I will tell you, I go through that a lot. I've been up since one in the morning for no reason at all uh, last night, uh, just out of the blue. And it stinks, it really sucks. Um, but you know what it feels like to have multiple nights in a row. Well, seven nights of bad sleep are really bad. Now, what would it mean if you were somebody that exercised on a regular basis and you couldn't exercise for a week? Well, it turns out, according to these researchers uh, hired by the running brand ASICS, that if you're a regular exerciser who takes seven days off from exercise, it's gonna have the same effect on your mental health as seven nights of not sleeping well. Basically, they had these regular exercisers take a week off from any physical fitness. What they found out, 23% increase in racing thoughts. Confidence dropped 20%, 16% uh, decrease in positivity. Energy levels dropped 23%. The ability to cope with stress dropped 22%. Now, all is not lost. People started exercising for a week once they were off the week of not exercising. 
all back to normal. Immediate improvements in well-being, which is fascinating that it recovers so fast, but really, really surprising how much of a toll not exercising takes on people that are used to exercising. The part of this study that got the most improvement I don't think is all that interesting, but I'll tell you just for here. This is the headline that you found online about this study. What I told you is what I want you to take home from it, but what the researchers figured out is that all it takes to improve your mood, all the exercise it takes on any given day, 15 minutes and nine seconds. Not really sure what the nine seconds, where that comes in, but that's all it takes to be in a better mood. All right, let's talk about running and arthritis. I, in my training, uh, in my residency for orthopedic surgery, I was at the Campbell Clinic in Memphis, world famous, uh, legendary orthopedic surgery training program. And multiple surgeons there, at least when I was there, were big believers that running causes arthritis. I go to Washington University in St. Louis for my sports medicine fellowship. They weren't as convinced that running was that harmful. Just you know, studies really didn't prove that. Um, but then I come to Charleston where I've been basically since my fellowship and pretty much every orthopedic surgeon tells people with arthritis, hey, look, you got to stop. It's going to make the arthritis worse and you're going to need a knee replacement. And I will tell you, I go into this very, very biased. I have never for a minute believed that. I have always thought that running is good for people whether or not they have arthritis. So when I saw this really recent study in clinical rheumatology, decided, hey, this would be good to share with you because we want people to be active, right? Even as you get older, you want people active. Now, it, it, for all kinds of reasons, it's good for your health, all the stuff we always talk about. And again, the orthopedic surgeons will say, hey, it's going to make your arthritis worse. And yes, I'm an orthopedic surgeon. I, I admit that that I'm just most orthopedic surgeons disagree with this. But here's the thing. If you talk to runners and I have treated so easily in the thousands of runners in my career and they don't want to do another kind of exercise. The orthopedic surgeon said, oh, you should walk, oh, you should ride the bike, you should swim, you should walk in the pool. They don't want to do that. They want to run. That's what they like to do. That's what gives them the, the joy of exercise and everything comes with it, mental health benefits and everything else. So we look at it as a sort of a pro and con thing. The potential benefits would be Running helps you lose uh, weight and keep your body mass index down. Better strength of the muscles in your leg and around your knee. Better proprioception, which is a joint position sense so your brain knows where your knee is in space. The flip side of that is, well, maybe running is like these orthopedic surgeons say. It's going to increase your risk of osteoarthritis, cause more damage from the uh, load, the ground reaction forces, and things like that. So this study, again, published in Clinical Rheumatology, wanted to know just how harmful running was in people that already had knee arthritis. They used the Osteoarthritis Initiative, which is a multi-center observational study. They took all the people that were in that database that were 50 and older and had diagnosed arthritis in at least one knee. And then of all those people, they they questioned all of them. They all filled out this, this questionnaire and basically identified which ones were runners. And I'll talk about how they did that in a second. But then both at baseline and then 48 months later, four years later, they assessed symptoms, basically knee pain, X-ray scores, the amount of arthritis on this scale called the Kelgren-Lawrence uh, scale, they assessed medial joint space narrowing, which is if the medial joint space, if you're looking at the knee, this is medial or the inside of the knee, this is a right knee, this is the lateral or the outside of the knee, you can tell by the fibula. Um, and the medial, this side, is the side that you get joint space narrowing. You get the meniscus tear, the cartilage and bone sort of collapse, so on X-ray, what looks like empty space, which is not empty space, that's just the meniscus, but that doesn't show up on x-ray, um, all of a sudden that space compresses in people with arthritis. So they assessed that at baseline and four years. They assessed things like, um, again, the x-ray scores, the medial joint space, new knee pain, worsened knee pain, improved knee pain, and they adjusted for how old people were, male, female, body mass index, and all of that kind of thing. And again, the way they identified who were runners, and again, there were about 12, uh, 1,200 people in this study, 
average age around 63. And they took people that listed running or jogging as a top three most physically performed physical activity that they did. And that meant that they had to do it at least time, uh, 10 times for 20 minutes each time. And um, these were fairly serious runners. They weren't, these weren't just people that just did it every now and then. They looked at the number of years they had been running, how many uh, months at a time, how many times a month, and all of them had at least grade two arthritis on x-ray scales. And again, they assessed knee pain at baseline and 48 uh, months later, and they asked questions to see how bad their knee pain was. Things like, hey, during the last 12 months, have you had pain, aching, stiffness around your knee most days uh, for at least, or on most days for at least, uh, most days in a month, I should say. And that by most days, more than half the days of the month, if it, you know, whether it was right knee or left knee, that's what they were asked. Of those 1,200-ish participants was a little more than 1,200. About 11% were runners. So about 90% non-runners to compare to the 11% that were runners. And what they found out, again, these are runners 50 years and older. Um, about three quarters of them had been running for six years or more. So these were serious runners. Uh, almost all of them, 93% ran five to 12 months a year and 89% ran at least four times a month. So these are not just people, that, you know, weekend warrior types. These are people that like to run. So you can't say, oh, that you didn't have a problem because they didn't run that much. What they found out, compared to the non-runners, runners did not have increased odds for worsening of the x-rays, worsening of the medial joint space narrowing, or new knee pain. The results were unchanged when they adjusted for age, body mass index, injury, x-ray score, other knee arthritis, or really anything else. So the, the researchers, the authors of the study, and, and literally, the, I'll, I'll read you the quote, they say, contrary to what we expected, we found little evidence to suggest that running is harmful. Among in, individuals over 40 with knee arthritis, running was not associated with worsening knee pain or progression of damage, structural damage on x-rays. In fact, runners actually had more improvement in knee pain compared to non-runners, which suggests there's some sort of benefit from running in people with arthritis. And they made sure to check that it had nothing to do with body mass index. They wanted to make sure that the runners weren't didn't turn out to be the, the lighter, the, the healthier ones and not the overweight people. No, that was the same in both groups. So that was not the difference. Now, why would running potentially be good or certainly not bad? They had a couple ideas and I, I'll give you my thoughts. They thought maybe running creates more muscle strength in the muscles around the knee to absorb some of those ground reaction forces from running. It could be that there's something about stimulating those muscles that helps in pain reduction. Or it could be a proprioception benefit. And proprioception, again, is a joint position sense where your, your brain knows where your knee is in space. So the brain could very, very subtly adjust where you land to try to modify how much pain you're going to get. We don't know what the benefit is. But certainly, what we can say is that running does not make arthritis worse. And before you say that oh, the runners probably had less arthritis. The ones with worse arthritis decided not to run anymore. It wasn't that. They checked for that too. The, the runners and the non-runners had the same degrees of osteoarthritis seen on those x-rays. So x-rays were not shown to be associated, or uh, running was not associated with worsening of the arthritis problem. So I, if you ever hear an orthopedic surgeon tell you not to run and you love to run, tell them uh, you're going to do it anyway. Now, some people get to where it's so painful they just can't do it, and I get that. And if you want to switch exercises at that point, by all means. But uh, resist this idea that you've got to stop uh, running. And here's my other thing. Again, those runners, the vast majority of them don't want to do anything else. And I would argue that even if it did lead to worse arthritis, worsening arthritis in the coming years, the benefits of running are so good from your cardiovascular standpoint, mental health standpoint, so, you know, high blood pressure, cholesterol, body weight, everything else that is so good to your overall health that outweighs the risk of potentially needing a knee replacement down the road. 
yeah, that knee replacement can be done. It doesn't do you any good if you died of a heart attack before you got to that point. So I, I've never been a big believer that oh, you just have to start stop running. It gets to a little bit of my frustrations with orthopedic surgery generally as a field, just going to, hey, surgery is the only option. You know, the, you know if all you have is a hammer, everything's a nail. That's what it really feels like is happening, especially in the joint replacement world. Uh, but my, I tell my patients, look, I don't need you to stop running. Yes, you may have to modify on a given day and we're gonna try some treatments to get you better. Yeah, I mean, and there's all sorts of things that we've talked about on this show, you know, PRP and exosomes and penicillin polysulfate, in addition to the stuff we already do. Uh, but uh, stopping running is, is not one of those. Jamie, it's good to see you. Uh, Soraya, I made, I apologize if I'm saying that wrong. I wish I could run again, can barely walk right now. Multiple ankle surgery, yeah. Used to run five to eight miles, three to five times a week. Yeah, I had ran for 13 years and then I gave it up and I, I'll be honest, I don't miss it. The only running I do now is once a week, sometimes twice a week, I run sprints for high intensity interval training. But I loved running when I did it. There is nothing that gives you endorphins like running. Uh, that's what I miss about it. But yeah, I'd be pretty, uh, uh, pretty uh, frustrated if I couldn't do that. Last I'm gonna talk about before I close up is I literally just read a study um, and I, I'm probably not going to talk about it on this show, uh, and, and I don't think it's new either. This, and if anybody knows any more about this, again, I don't, uh, I can't say I'm a, a I'm learning about this world, but I, I don't know that much about it. So we all know nitric oxide is a vasodilator, or hopefully know that. Uh, it's found in beets, it's found in spinach, it's found in kale, and that vasodilation helps us perform in sports and exercise. That's why uh, so many Olympic athletes drink beetroot juice. It, it's basically a uh, performance enhancer, opening up the blood vessels, increasing blood flow to your muscles, uh, smooth muscle um, relaxation in the blood vessels, and it just overall performance increase. Well, there's ways you can get nitric oxide. One, you can uh, your body can make it from arginine, which is a, uh, an amino acid, turns it into nitric oxide. Works real well in young people, not as well in older people. Or you can get it from dietary nitrates and nitrites, like the beets, like the spinach and kale. But here's the thing. For, it to, for nitrates and nitrites to be converted into nitric oxide, the bacteria in your mouth do some sort of enzymatic reaction to help make that conversion. Same with stomach acid, both are required. If you take a lot of antacids, proton pump inhibitors especially, but that's not where I'm, it interferes with that process. But the one I found interesting is if you use an antiseptic mouthwash, it gets rid of those bacteria, then you're not making nitric oxide that way. So something to think about all the, you know, the different antiseptic uh, mouthwashes, maybe not so good if you're a high level athlete uh, especially as you get older. Again, I don't know that much about that, but I thought that was uh, uh, really interesting. All right, uh, yeah, definitely frustrated. Mental health therapy. Didn't Once I got in the groove, I felt better in every way. Um, the, and Don, uh, better to give up running? <sighs> It depends, uh, and, and it, to be fair, I, I can't really address the tibial plateau part. If you wanna to come tomorrow at noon, ask Dr. Guy or live, I answer orthopedic questions, but specifically about the running part. Once fractures heal, I'm okay with running. Where I suspect there, post-traumatic arthritis might be a different animal than just general arthritis, meaning you have tibial plateau fracture is the top of this bone here, and a type four would be on the medial side. Um, where if it goes up into the joint, then you can actually have like not a smooth surface anymore and then it gets pretty quick arthritis. That might be a different animal, but again, I I am not the, uh, if people like running and can do it, I am not as concerned. Maybe the arthritis might progress a little bit faster. Uh, I don't really know. And Anthony, like I was telling uh, uh, Don, uh, I don't do orthopedic questions on the Better Than Ever live shows at 5 p.m., but join us tomorrow uh, on Friday, 12 p.m. Eastern time. I am happy to answer that question. That is all I have got for you. If you know people that like these stories, these research articles, health, wellness, definitely tell them about this show. 
Make sure to subscribe, click the bell to be notified when I'm on live, when I release new videos. Also, if you want to see me formally as a patient, if you have an orthopedic injury and you don't want to just hear that your only options are surgery or cortisone shots and you want to hear all kinds of options, I am happy to see you. Double board certified orthopedic surgeon and sports medicine specialist. Hopefully by this fall, triple board certified also in anti-aging and regenerative medicine. But uh, I am happy to see you in here in Charleston, South Carolina. If you go to, I don't have a screen uh, shot of it, but if you go to my website, which is listed in the description below, Dr. drdavidgeier.com, D-R-D-A-V-I-D-G-E-I-E-R. Go to the contact page in the upper right hand corner. There's a form that you fill out. It gets to me and my assistant, and we can tell you, you know, potentially how we could set up an appointment here in Charleston or other ways we could potentially work together. Oh, it's so good to meet you. I really appreciate that. Uh, very glad to have you uh, join us every Tuesday and Thursday. I love uh, the more the merrier. That is all I've got for you. I will be here tomorrow, uh, Friday. Yes, tomorrow is Friday, 12 p.m. Eastern time for Ask Dr. Guyer Live. I will stay for as many questions as people have. If it's a cartilage, meniscus, ligament, tendon, muscle injury, if it's a health or wellness question injury, I am happy to answer it. I will stay as long as there are questions. But yes, you do have to be there live, and there will not be a podcast version of that. The podcasts are only for the Tuesday and Thursday Better Than Ever live shows. Look forward to seeing you there If you miss me tomorrow, if you're not coming tomorrow, I will be out Tuesday and Thursday next week. I am traveling, but I will be back Friday again for Ask Dr. Guy or Live. Thank you so much for joining. Get out there and run if you like to run, and I'll see you right here next time.